Blog Talk Radio. Hi, everybody. This is uh, Silvio Canto in Dallas, uh, Texas, on Tuesday, October the 4th. And today we're going to catch up with my good friend Bob Parks. We're going to talk about the Trump campaign. And uh, I want to get into a few things with Bob. He's been, of course, following the campaign a lot longer uh, than I have. But I want to get a sense of the state of the race, where exactly – uh, if this was a, a series, for example, uh, after three games, is it 2-1, is it 3-0? Where is uh, the series right now, or where is this race between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton? Depending on what poll you read, I mean, either he's up by five or she's up by six. It's that kind of a crazy situation. So I want to get Bob's uh, perspective on that. I also want to talk about some of the controversies surrounding the Donald Trump campaign. The New York Times controversy, that really doesn't, I don't think that's going to hurt him much. I really don't, because the New York Times was so over the top with that story that I think most Americans will see it for what it is. It was nothing but a hit piece on Donald Trump. But some of the other things, like the Twitter and some of the things he said and some of his behavior, that has uh, created some controversy. And there are times when I've been frustrated with Donald Trump because of stuff like that. So we'll talk about the state of the race the controversies uh, of Donald Trump, or at least uh, what some people consider controversies. And then we'll take a look at the black vote. Where is the black vote with Donald Trump this year? What percentage could he possibly get uh, of the black population? Let's talk about this campaign, because you've been actively following the campaign and writing a great deal about it. And I want to get your sense of where this campaign is. I use the analogy of, you know, like the World Series after so many games, where is it? And uh, if this was a, a, a best of seven series after three games where or four games, who's ahead uh, in your book, Bob? Well, let's put it this way. You have one team. So let's just say, for example, and I'm not going to take this personally toward myself because I really don't like them, but the New York Yankees have always been known to be one that overfinances. They're always considered to be the bull. So instead of the finances, you look at it as the amount of votes. Donald Trump got far and away more votes than any other Republican candidate in a presidential race in history. So he's got that going for him. He's going up against another team that has never really been that good, but they basically got in because they won their division. So there is a third element to this scenario. What would happen if we all knew going into the World Series that all of the umpires were bought and paid for? <laughs> Right. For the other team, okay, the team that was not the favorite. You know where I'm going with this. Yes. So when it comes to all the polls, obviously the liberal media is skewing. You have a good portion of the conservative media skewing uh, made up of the high and mighty, superior, principled conservative media. And I say that with a certain amount of disdain because if you remember over the years of presidential politics, when we were given a Bob Dole, when we were given a John McCain, we were given a Mitt Romney. There were other candidates that ran against them, but when it got whittled down to three guys, well, let's make it four with George W. Bush, we were all told, okay, well, let's all get behind this candidate because the alternative is to have the Democrat win. Now, what was different this time is that the big money, the GOP establishment money, the GOP establishment and the consultants and the strategists, they're basically they're the recipients of all that donor money. They all went in for Jeb Bush, for the most part, because he got the most money. Then you have this guy out of nowhere, this guy Donald Trump, who everybody liked before the election. Okay, Donald Trump gets in. And during his announcement speech, he went after the illegal aliens, which a lot of Republicans and a lot of Americans in general who dislike the fact that there are people who come across the border, break our laws, and are rewarded. So he said some things that if it was a horse race, it would have been like him coming up lame right out of the starting gate. And everybody said his campaign was dead on arrival. But what happened? He took off. And he started knocking off these candidates one by one by one, even the ones with the big money that we're supposed to. I mean, can you imagine where we would be right now today with all the media piled up in favor of Hillary Clinton if our candidate was Jeb Bush? 
It'd probably be about the same. I mean, I would think, but that you know, I don't want to get into a debate about Bush. But I, I, I know what you're saying that the, the yeah. media is so much. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead and finish your. Oh thought. no, no. But I, but what I'm saying is the the thing that is always enamored Laura and I and millions, obviously millions of other Trump supporters, is the fact that he does not lay down to the media. He right. as met as That's many. True. As many Republicans have, the media would say, oh, you said this, and all of a sudden the Republican would back up and say, oh, well, I didn't mean to say that. Meanwhile, Donald Trump said, yeah, I did, and here's some more. So he is fighting back. But the thing is, now you have these Republican sore losers, their candidate didn't get in, and instead of adhering to the same thing that they told us that we had to do in the past four presidential election cycles with different Republican candidates, that we were to get in line and support that candidate, you have a bunch of Republicans on Capitol Hill who just today came out and said that they could work with Hillary Clinton. I mean, come on. This this is absurd. And then they're going to turn around and say, well, if Hillary wins, don't blame us. I'm sorry. If Hillary wins and you voted for Hillary or you stayed home, guess what? There is no one else to blame. If you get back to your question, the state of the campaign, I think Laura and I have talked about it many times. We've looked and seen the skewed media. Would the media be going all this bat, you know what, crazy if Hillary was out in front? No, I think this is. is, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was, gonna, no, I I was mean, just going to say that that there's two. There, the, the one thing that that I've always felt in this campaign, and I mean, it, I, if I was answering the question, what is the state of the race? I would say it's in the margin of error, meaning at this moment, two up here, two three here, that kind of thing. It's within the margin of error and very much a winnable campaign for Donald Trump. But the one thing Donald Trump has going for him, and I, I see more and more of this over the last thirty days, Bob. Is that, you know, there's this, I don't know if you remember Reggie Jackson, who had this incredible ability to, 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 for the dramatic. And, and I, of these two candidates, the one who I think will surprise us on Election Day will be Donald Trump. I would not be surprised if, if Donald Trump gets more votes, in other words, than the polls are saying. I wouldn't be surprised if he outperform, outperforms the polls. I don't sense that with Hillary. I think what you're seeing with Hillary is about as much as she's going to get. But there, there is a hidden factor. There's something out there for Donald Trump. And I'll, I'll just give you a, a very unscientific explanation for this, or at least something I've seen. Uh, I, more than one person has said to me that if you travel across the country, I've seen this on Facebook by several friends, if you go from one city to another and you go through small towns, you don't see any Hillary Clinton signs, but you see a bunch of Donald Trump signs. What that says to me is that Trump has the passion. And give me passion on Election Day because that can get you a few points, uh, Bob. You know, Laura and I have been driving around. We have seen exactly the same thing. We see Trump signs of all different sizes all over the place, and we can see a smattering of Hillary Clinton signs and bumper stickers. And another thing you have to also consider with these polls, because if you're going to be a pollster, you need to be able to do things in a fair and impartial manner. And when almost every single poll oversamples Democrats, what do you expect is going to happen? You would think that if you're going to have a poll, you're going to ask an equal amount of Republicans and an equal amount of Democrats. They never do that. When you talk about the enthusiasm factor, when you talk about these rallies where you have 10,000 people showing up at a Trump rally, 10, 15,000, and then you see the reports of maybe two or 300 at a Hillary rally, or sometimes even a lot less than that, and just the way that they will frame a picture when they shoot it, they make it look like there's a whole bunch of people, but then you'll have somebody sneak off and shoot a picture of the entire room, and you'll see that it's mostly empty. So the enthusiasm factor is not going Hillary's way. And when you look at the things that they do are clear signs. The weekend before the first debate, the Friday, what is everybody in the media reciting that they're getting these marching orders from the Hillary campaign that Donald Trump is a liar? Every news channel, every newspaper, it's all Donald Trump trustworthy, Donald Trump lies, Donald Trump liars. And it just repeated that whole cycle for the whole weekend through the Sunday talk shows leading right into the debate. Because Hillary cannot carry it on her own. She never has been. She's always needed to be helped along and had a path cleared for her because she is just that weak a candidate. And the last person that she thought 
and that anybody thought. The sore losers are not just the people who didn't vote for Trump during the primaries, the Republicans. The other sore losers are all the media people who predicted a year and a half ago that Donald Trump didn't have a shot in hell to win this thing, win the primary, let alone a good chance to win the presidency. They all have egg on their face. You know, in the media, all you got is your credibility. And if you're known to be biased in the first place and then also right. to, to top that off, inaccurate, then it's a double whammy. I and Laura, we're in the, the mind that this is not just going to be a victory for Donald Trump, but a very good chance that this could be a blowout. Well, and, and, and I think that, again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with anecdotal evidence, as they say, which is, you know, not polling data, but I'll just tell you my own personal experiences. Uh, my son, our number two son, went to a Trump, has been to several Trump rallies, and he, the last one he said, he, he was telling me how many young people there were at the rally, which sort of defies all of the, you know, the conventional wisdom that it's just a bunch of older white guys. No, he says there's a ton of of young people, uh, many of them his friends uh, from law school who were there. So that's one example. Uh, and that's anecdotal, I understand, but, but it's an example. The other one is the trouble that Mark Cuban has gotten into in the Dallas area because of his politics. Nobody really, n nobody, Mark Cuban never really talked politics that much. But this year, I mean, the number of people that I've talked to on Facebook and so on who tell me they're not watching the Mavericks, uh, or they're angry with Cuban. I mean, that, uh, again, that's anecdotal. I understand it's not a scientific poll, but, you know, I don't hear that about, I, I never heard that uh, about other candidates, uh, about other team owners before. So something is happening. And that's why I go back to my point that I think Donald Trump does have an extra factor here. And that's, uh, and, and that's this enthusiasm that, frankly, I have not seen. Uh, in quite some time in any in any election. So I think that's the one thing going for him. Now, let me take you to another subject, because I get a little frustrated about this. I have to be honest with you. You're a good friend of mine, so I mm -hmm. have to be honest. I get frustrated uh, with some of the things that Donald Trump does. For example, uh, tweeting at 3 o'clock in the morning about a Miss Universe. I understand they took a cheap shot at him, and I understand he wants to defend himself. I get all of that. But in life, you pick your fights, and getting into a fight over Miss Universe or uh, a couple of parents of an Iraqi war veteran or whatever, uh, it, it, does he understand that he doesn't have to fight back on everything, that he can pick his fights and, and just let the other stuff go by, Bob? Sure, I'm sure he does. Again, going back to that sports analogy, you do what got you there. And I will fully take for granted that Donald Trump knows the gravity of what he's doing. He knows where he is potentially in the United States, if not world history. But at the same time, that's just who he is. And I would be hesitant to say that he's Teflon, although it doesn't seem to me that – or Laura or anybody else who's watching this campaign go by – that a lot of these mistakes really hurt him. And, you know, and going back to the media, and we look at the media as being dishonest, okay? So when you're talking to a dishonest person, what is the first thing when you know that you're talking to somebody who's BSing you? That whatever they say, the opposite is probably the truth, correct? So if the media is all yes. saying that the race is really this tight, Hillary Clinton is up by four or five points, well, if you're dealing with liars then whatever they say, the opposite must be true. Either that, you're setting yourself up to be gullible. Now, mm. Donald Trump, he's a person who we know from what we've been hearing about him over the years as a successful businessman. He's up all hours of the night working and doing this. So you know something? If the man has some time to tweet and there's something that gets under his skin and he wants to get it out there because he knows if he doesn't get it out there, that he can't count on the media to set the record straight. And if he wants to take it to him, you know something, he's the candidate. It is so easy. Unless you've run a campaign. Now, I am one of these people who has had the opportunity to run in two races, one state, one federal. There are other people who have been candidates. And we understand that there are pressures. There are things that you do and you say and you think, oh, in retrospect, maybe I shouldn't have said this, maybe I should have said that. But to have all of these other armchair candidates who just wait for him to put in four letters into Twitter that they can mischaracterize or criticize to boost themselves up to be much more intellectually superior to Donald Trump, and this is what he shouldn't have done, and you know something, 
Donald is the candidate. He is going to have to live by the decisions that he makes. And I'm sure at some point, because of his success over the years, that he is fully capable of doing a retrospect of what he has done and determine, should I do this again, should I not do this again, and if I do, this is how I should do it. You know something? He's the candidate. He wants to tweet. I let him tweet. Now, let me uh, let me go on to another topic. Before I do, can you stay with me a little bit longer, like another 10 minutes longer today? Because I want to develop – do you have a few uh, – I'm not, sure, I know I, I gave you – do you have time? Okay, because I want to take a little break right now and then come back and, and talk about, continue talking about this and also talk about uh, Donald Trump and black voters. Let me get back to my good friend Bob Parks. Uh, Bob, anything else you wanted to say about the last topic? Uh, or at least I just wanted to say I don't think, I think the New York Times, let me just say this, New York Times article that came out on Sunday I think was so over the top that, I don't think that really hurt Donald Trump. In many ways, it may have strengthened his support. So I don't think that's an issue. I mean, when the New York Times goes after him like that, I think it actually helps him. But you you asked the question before uh, about would the media be doing this if they thought Hillary Clinton was ahead. It kind of ties into my next point. Uh, They're playing the race card like crazy in the Clinton campaign which would lead me to believe, Bob, I I don't know what information you have, but would lead me to believe that they're not sensing a lot of excitement in the African-American neighborhoods for, for Hillary Clinton or in the country as a whole, and they're getting a little desperate. That, that's what I think about that, uh, Bob. What, what is your sense? Well, it has always been a consistent theme over the years that when it comes to the presidential election and Republicans and Democrats, the numbers normally are relatively even. The determining factor, the tipping point, the straw in the back, whatever you want to call it, is the black vote. And we've seen it that in years when the black vote stays home or is not enthusiastic as it could be, the Republican wins. When the black vote is fully engaged and active, it usually can tilt an election toward the Democrat. Democrats, for years have always taken the black vote for granted. I mean, every two years, and I'm sure over the years you and I have talked about this, and I've basically been playing broken record here, that every two to four years, Democrats are called on the carpet by black leaders and black politicians and black Democrat districts, and they're told, don't take the black vote for granted. So why is this? It's because every two to four years, Democrats come into the black community, scream racism, They say, this is what we'll do for you. This is what we're going to do to address racism, address this, address that. Just give us your vote. And as soon as the election's over, the black vote is forgotten. The only time that that was really different was the last two presidential cycles where the black voters weren't promised anything. It was just the opportunity to vote for the first black president twice. But Hillary Clinton is not getting that kind of love. She's not a very charismatic candidate. If you listen to her, she can even sound pretty mean. So she's not a person that would endear voters in general, black voters in particular. And formally, Republicans tend to get, if they're lucky, 5% of the black vote, which is never enough. And I've said this for years, that if the Republicans could ever have a presidential candidate that could get more than 10, 20 percent of the black vote, election is over. And right. we, hear, we hear the GOP every, every presidential cycle, because it always takes a presidential cycle for the GOP to decide we're going to do minority outreach. But Donald Trump did that on his own. He went after the black vote in ways that we have not seen a Republican candidate do for a long time. And I don't know if this is also tying back into the never Trumpers. You know, every once in a while when they get comfortable talking about their position, they talk about conservative principles and purity. They want to keep the purity of the Republican vote, the conservative vote. And now Donald Trump is bringing in all these people who in some cases are Democrats. Some people were former Democrats. They changed their party registration to become Republicans. You're getting black voters in. You're getting Hispanic voters in because Donald Trump is just taking it right to the Democrats, right on their home field. So I think the, the black vote is much more up for grabs as it has been in probably our lifetime. 
because right. of the efforts that Donald Trump has consciously made. And he's not doing it in a pandering fashion. He's coming right out and telling black people in the black community, you know what's wrong here, and you know you've been voting for these same people, and Hillary Clinton's not going to do squat to help right. you. That's right. No, I think that's a very good point. And, and I, I, one of the, the attractions of Donald Trump uh, when he became the you know the de facto nominee after Indiana, is I kept thinking to myself that I felt that of all the guys running for president, even Dr. Carson, that I thought Donald Trump had the best chance uh, to to get a higher percentage of the of the black vote, African American vote, whatever whatever you call it. And the reason is because he was a successful businessman. And he never had a record of racism in his life. I mean, there's never been any record of Donald Trump uh, engaging in any kind of racism or anything like that. But now they're throwing this racist card at him, saying that 30 years ago he evicted some landlords. Uh, So they must be worried if they're playing that game, Bob. Well, first off, that was his father. Okay, we can't always be held to account for the things that our father did. And... Since then, how many people have sued Donald Trump for racism in a way that we heard about it prior to him? I mean, all of these problems, him being a misogynist and him being a racist and him being, uh, you know, a slumlord owner. And I mean, everything that they have thrown at Donald Trump, a lot of these media people who, especially the media in, uh, in New York City, they stay at Donald Trump's hotels. They've gone to his parties. A lot of these conservative blog websites, they go on bended knee to Donald Trump for donations. In some cases, they didn't get the donations, and so they went on a tirade against Donald Trump, not because of him personally. It's because he didn't give them any money. What turned Donald Trump into this monster, aside from the fact that he decided to run for president and right. running against the person who was supposed to be coronated? Right. No, and, and as you well know, uh Bob, he nobody called him a racist when he was giving money to the Clinton Foundation or to Democrat candidates and even to to Jesse Jackson. But I've always felt that this is very unfair to to play this uh, or to call Donald Trump a racist because I've been following his career for a long time. I have to confess, I never thought he would run for president, but I've been following his career for a long time. And a lot of things have been said about Donald Trump, good and bad, but never racism. I mean, there was never any any sense that Donald Trump was uh, was a racist man or that he was engaging in any kind of race behavior that would be considered racist. So I think it's a real cheap shot. And 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 on that score, I'm glad to see him fight back because he's got to give it right back to to the media. But the way he's fighting back, it seems to me, is is as you say, going to into these communities and asking for their vote. Something that you and I have talked about this before, but no GOP presidential presidential candidate that I recall ever went down to a black church and said, hey, vote for me. I think I can do something for you. I don't recall that, Bob. Can you go back and think about Mitt Romney making an overture to the black vote, um, John McCain? I can't remember them well, the ever. Only one that I, the only one, Bob, that I remember, and in all fairness to, I mean, Donald Trump, I mean, uh, Mitt Romney and, and, and John McCain, were very traditional in how they campaigned. and But I do remember George W. Bush back in 2000 going to the Urban League and, and here in Texas as governor and talking to many black organizations and being well-received by these mm-hmm. organizations. And, and he always had pretty good ratings here with, with blacks in Texas. But you're right, not not any of the other candidates, because they, they basically wrote off uh, the black vote. That was my sense that, you know, they figured, hey, she's going to get or he's going to get 95 percent. Let's not worry about that. Let's worry about the other people. That, I think that was the way the way Republicans used to run campaign uh, until this year, Bob. Yes, and it's always very telling, too, when candidates write things off. I remember um, in 2008 when I was living in New England to just to find out that the McCain campaign decided at one point that they were going to write off New England. For years, we've been told that the road to the White House goes through Ohio. 
And now all of a sudden the Hillary campaign is packed up and they decided that they're writing off Ohio. And all of a sudden the liberal media is saying, well, you know, Ohio is never really that right. important. That's right. You know? That's right. And, you know, That's and they're doing this with all of the states. Talk about the race card. I think it was – I can't remember what state it was, but they said that she's pulling out because that state is just too white. So, okay. <laughs> when it comes to playing the race card, the Democrats are historically the last people to be playing the race card when it comes to anything. And when they do play it, it's because it's basically their Hail Mary. Yes, no, I, I agree with you. And, and I would say that if, you know, if Donald Trump is able to get a significant chunk of the, of the black vote, and by significant I mean 15, 20 percent, I think if he did that, it could really change the land, the landscape of the country, because then all of a sudden you're going to see a lot more Senate seats that are also going to be competitive that were not uh, before. But, Bob, I want to thank you very much for joining us. It's always a lot of fun to chat with you. Keep up the great work. Uh, and uh, I have a link to your website and the show information, but take a minute and talk about your website. Blackandblondemedia.com. That's blonde with an E. We try to keep up with our video duties. We try to keep the website stocked with information on a daily basis, stuff that you don't always see on the Drudge Report or you see on the, the mainstream media news or websites. We try to offer perspectives that not everybody parrots and try to give people a different way of looking at things. So we're also on Twitter. We're on Facebook. And we invite um, your audience to drop in any time. And, you know, it's great talking to you, Silvio. It's been a while. It's been a while, and, uh, but I had, uh, I had a note here to, to, to do a show about Trump with you. I'm sorry that it took us a little long, but uh, it's never too late. But we'll do, uh, we'll do one more before the, the election. I, I want to do a lot of election shows the week before and kind of go over some of the things. that. Uh, so uh, count on, on having an invitation toward the end of October. I think we have a lot to talk about. That sounds great. Looking forward to it, Silvio. Thank you very much. Give my best to Laura and uh, my very best to both of you and continue the great work that you do. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon.